Warning, the following film contains even more wild speculation than the previous segment. May cause illumination, major epiphanies, and most definitely facepalm injuries at certain points. Imagination and an open mind are strongly suggested. C-17K2, the record breaker, furthest active inbound comet ever seen, electrically connecting to our sun, even that far out to turn blue star Kachina. This is going to be an important comet coming through. There's been very little coverage of this thing since this has been reported on, and I'm wondering why. If it was this electrically active that far out, it should be followed month by month as the intensity would increase and this thing gets a tail. And it has the same color as the blue star Kachina. And it's real interesting that it would be wandering through our solar system right now with all these incredible changes on our planet. And this blue star is supposed to be a marker of a time of change, and this is happening right now? now I can't believe it's all just random happenstance. I can't. Blue dot there on the left, January 2020 is where the comet is now. It's going to be reaching closest to our planet July of 2022. So it'll be intensifying in brightness each and every month as we move through now in the next year and a half. Now, the amount of change in the next year and a half is going to shock our societies on this planet. So when this blue star Kachina arrives in our skies and our crops are being wiped out from all these unbelievable jet stream patterns and all of the tumultuous happenings on our planet and we get the arrival of a sign in the skies talked about from the Hopi prophecies, this is going to be a sign that will rock our planet. There is something historically exceptional going on right now. The planets and stars are shifting into dramatic alignment positioning never before seen in modern recorded history. And these celestial dramas are reflecting political, financial, social, and cultural chaos here on Earth. In the last 140 years, all major planetary alignment conjunctions fell on astrological Earth signs, but for the next 140 years, they are set to fall on air signs, marking the age of Aquarius, as we have discussed in this film. The last time the Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto conjunction happened was a few months long, 3,000 years ago in 1894 BC, when we're told the great Babylonian and Sumerian empires rose. They will align three different times throughout this year of 2020 alone. On January 12th, we will see the Saturn and Pluto conjunction, which normally happens once every 35 years. On April 4th, June 30th, and November 12th, we will see the Jupiter-Pluto conjunction three times which normally happens only once every 13 years. We will see an annular solar eclipse on the summer solstice, June 21st, after just having a solar eclipse on the winter solstice of December 21st, 2019. Finally, on the December 21st winter solstice, we will see a Saturn-Jupiter alignment, which normally happens only once every 20 years. Eight extremely rare alignment conjunctions in one year, plus a solar eclipse. The words lunatic and lunacy come from luna or lunar, the moon, as people go crazy during the full moon. But there is no word to describe what is going to happen during these much larger and more important energetic alignments this year, which are not only unheard of in astrological records, but take a look around you at the world today. This place appears to have completely lost the plot, and rightly so.
In his book, Postlude to the Adam and Eve Story, cataclysm scientist Chan Thomas based his reset hypothesis on the works of Royal Society Jesuit Freemason Hannes Alfin and his theory of magneto-hydrodynamic energy. Alfin himself experimented with liquid mercury hooked up to electric eddy currents to induce an electromagnetic field in the mercury, causing the liquid mercury to act as a near-solid plastic instead once the electromagnetic field was introduced. Alfin himself was expanding on the works of James Clerk Maxwell, as the Beatles sang, Bang Bang Maxwell's Silver Mercury Hammer came down on your head and made sure you were dead. Alfin proposed that our galaxy contained a large-scale magnetic field and that charged particles moved in spiral orbits within it, plasma carrying the electric currents which create the magnetic field. Thomas proposed that these electromagnetic space currents turn the Earth's mantle into a near-solid plastic rather than liquid by interacting with the Earth's magnetic field via its north and south magnetic poles. The same as eddy currents had turned liquid mercury into a near-solid plastic in Alfin's experiments. And that this not-quite-solid plastic mantle, forget superglue, is the reason why centrifugal force does not constantly throw our continents around our planet at such incredible force and speeds, despite allegedly spinning around at a thousand miles per hour while corkscrewing wildly around a sun, dragging us more than 60,000 miles per hour around a galaxy, dragging us around a universe at millions of miles per hour because the near plastic mantle holds us in place against these unfathomable forces. But wait, it gets even more unbelievable. Every so many thousands of years on this galactic lap, we hit a patch of space with a magnetic null or reversal zone that weakens our normally stable electromagnetic eddy currents, which allows our semi-plastic mantle to return to a liquid floating state, and this sends our continent sliding and drifting all over the planet in a matter of hours until Earth finds a new equilibrium point of balance. <music> Apparently, the ice-covered polar continents are so much more heavy than the much larger mountain-covered continents that they slide even more over the now-liquid mantle from the incredible weight of frozen water on them, with centrifugal force sending them to the equator. As the continents shift and slosh about, moving from north to south or vice versa, they now encounter the thousand mile per hour winds still going from the Earth's rotation, which kicks up the ionic windstorms, fires, tsunamis, mountain ranges rising in a matter of seconds from tectonic plate crashes that no living soul on Earth could possibly survive, so help them God. This is the theory of the space ball cataclysm. There is obviously no explanation as to why there are thousands of years of magnetic stability on this galactic lap and then only one day of chaos, only to return to a stabilized eddy current field, if even reversed like a magnetic pole shift. But is there any geological or scientific evidence to support such a whopper of a theory? Well, yes and no, depending on if the evidence was cherry-picked to prove this theory or if this theory was based on no other plausible possibilities to explain the evidence. 
Physics is mathematical not because we know so much about the physical world, but because we know so little. The Beresovka mammoth was found frozen in Siberia with fresh preserved buttercups still in his mouth and stomach. Professionals from the meatpacking industry correctly agreed that the temperature had to have dropped dozens of degrees instantly for his massive body and even the fresh buttercups to have frozen through consistently and evenly without tissue rot or damage. However, the assumption was made that he must have been in a warmer place that suddenly slid into the current location of Siberia on the globe model, and that's why he froze instantly. But they failed to notice he was a fully furred woolly mammoth, already evolved for living in freezing cold regions, or to explain how his body survived the hypersonic winds and tidal waves that would accompany an instantaneous continental plate slide easily crushing mountains, but not him. The coral reef on the Arctic floor assumes that it must have moved there, but what if it was once actually warm there? As shown on dozens of maps predating the 1600s Maunder Grand Solar Minimum, There is undeniable evidence of major water-based geological changes in sea level, rock stratification, and sudden ice ages. And we recommend that you read Chan Thomas's Adam and Eve story for greater detail on these things. But what about the Lichtenberg scorches all over the earth? Or the billions of thriving species alive today who couldn't possibly have survived such devastating events? or the many native and biblical tales of 40 days of rain? What about the thousands of ancient structures still standing, or the stories of the sun standing still, reversing direction, or going away for several days, or the sudden appearance of comets that always accompany these massive earth changes? The CIA released a translated 1948 Russian document on the study of outer gravitational field and the shape of the physical Earth. Scientists were studying Earth physics, applied geophysics, and researching causes of sun halos and atmospheric brightness derived on the assumption of a flat Earth. Though it was made quite clear in the document that the shape of the Earth was unknown in 1948. Quite strange, considering the first globe was made in 1491 and Universal Pictures has been flashing them in our face since 1912. Then in 1961, NASA released a paper on how to calculate wind compensation for launching unguided rockets. The trajectory computations to pull this off were based on a flat, non-rotating Earth. In 1971, NASA studied getting single-stage rockets from rest to vertical and finally horizontal velocity, assuming a flat, non-rotating Earth. In 1972, NASA creates radar sideslip data technology for use where a flat, non-rotating Earth may be assumed. In 1978, NASA studies aircraft landing trajectories and variable wind fields based on the assumption that the Earth is flat and non-rotating. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know. 
but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and and that's the way it happened. And, and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. So in the future, if we want to keep doing something, we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going. Uh, money. In 1987, NASA puts out a user manual for linear, used for determining engine torque and thrust, flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. 1988, NASA, Manual for Flight Testing of V-Stole Aircraft describes the kinetics of the craft's motion over a flat, non-rotating Earth. 1991, NASA Aircraft Model for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics discusses equations of motion and atmospheric model for flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. The 1997 NASA document on predicted thrust performance for the SR-71 Blackbird, carrying an external payload like another aircraft on its back, discusses flying in non-turbulent atmosphere, zero side forces, and a non-rotating Earth. NASA, 1997, singular arc optimal climb trajectory of aircraft in a vertical plane on a non-rotating flat Earth. In 2000, the U.S. Army Research Lab released a study on how many volume decibels of loss would happen for 3-meter antenna over ranges of 200 to 410 meters in the woods over a flat Earth. In 2001, the Army Research Lab released a paper on the propagation of electromagnetic fields over flat Earth. In 2002, NASA is now back with the actual flight test results of the SR-71 Blackbird carrying a mounted aircraft over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Nothing to see here, people. Move along. 2002, Army Research Lab's laser range targeting system over a flat Earth. 2003, Army Research Lab user manual for fast field scanning which works over a flat earth and non-turbulent atmosphere. In the 2009 Army Research Lab paper on computing efficient algorithms for estimating the angle of arrival of helicopters using acoustic arrays, they admit in the paper that the actual results were not close to the anticipated results, which may be caused by a, quote, violation of the assumption of the flat earth model, unquote meaning they used the spherical earth mathematics for their predictions and it didn't even come close to the actual results. Finally, in 2010, the Army Research Lab released a paper on the trajectory effects of adding liquid payloads to spinning projectiles, admitting the equations they used for projectile flight dynamics assume a flat earth. So let's talk about the money because the money gets really interesting and if people don't understand the money then you don't understand the lie. $56 million a day, of course you've heard that 56 million times probably this weekend. Uh, but we need to talk about how big the space economy is. Okay, That is the music industry at $19.3 billion in 2018. The movie industry is $43 billion in 2018. Okay? We can even add to the movie by going with home entertainment. That includes your Blu-ray players, your DVD players, your home entertainment systems, your TVs. Even with all that, we're still at $136 billion for all of movies. That's box office, that's theaters, that's every movie made in Hollywood. Okay, That's how much that entire industry is worth. The video game industry, $137 billion, one of the biggest industries that there is. We can add those all together. 
combo of everything music that you've ever seen music, home entertainment, movies, box office, Hollywood, video games. That includes on your apps, on your phone, Xbox, PlayStation. That's the space industry. $410 billion. So when people ask why the lie, well, what good does it do? What, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a huge difference to those that are involved, NASA, the people they pay, JPL, the organizations that they deal with, all these other countries. And again, this is a worldwide economy. Pan tam do przyziemia rzeczywiście jest kulą zawieszoną w kosmosie. Jest płaska. Tak jak oczekują oni. Nie spodziewałem się do tego pytania, ale zapewnie pan, że jest płaska. Generał Mirosław Hermoszewski, jak dotąd pierwszy i ostatni Polak, który odbył lot orbitalny. Dziękuję serdecznie za rozmowę. Dzięki. Dziękuję dokładnie. If it turns out that NASA the U.S. Army and the burgeoning flat earth movement's geocentric models are actually correct, rendering this magnetic galaxy lap and slipping continental plates theory impossible on a, quote, flat, non-rotating earth, as NASA calls it, and thus Big Bang heliocentric space is really just a big business racket and a scam, then how do their models explain these cataclysms? To start with, there are dozens of theoretical flat Earth models, and this is not one of them. Neither is this. One by one, the financial capitals of the world crumbling under the might of their business acumen. Or so it would have been, if certain modern theories concerning the shape of the world had not proved to be disastrously wrong. Despite the numerous nuances, one of the things all of these ancient and modern models have in common is the idea that the Earth, at least the part we know of, is sealed off in some kind of enclosure or dome above us, around us, and even below us in some models. This idea is key for plasma discharge and flooding events on the flat Earth models. Some speculate that this dome or enclosure is made of an electromagnetic primer field. Others claim an actual constructed dome of iron and various gems, as the so-called meteors that fall from the enclosure are all made of. Some say it is the natural arc of energy movement. Some speculate it is an air pocket, like a giant bubble floating in infinite waters, or maybe it's a combination of all of the above. Whatever is theorized to be beyond the enclosure or firmament is up for conjecture and a fascinating subject, but for a few exceptions we'll get into, has little relevance to the point of this section of the film. Whether it's actual space, infinite water, God, heaven, another dimension, infinite magnetic field potential, or we are just a puddle in an infinite plane of ice or energy, or none of the above, I couldn't possibly tell you, and neither can NASA. Another thing most models have in common is the idea that our plane and this dome is circled and met by a great barrier made of either ice or liquefied air for it constitutes a very good reason for the formation of the immeasurable and insurmountable ice barrier, which may one day be discovered to be liquefied air. It is a scientific fact that the icy waters of the so-called polar seas contain an immense quantity of calimur, or potassium chloride, as this salt is chemically capable of producing great cold we have further evidence of the possibility that the supposed ice barrier is really liquefied air. And finally, the enclosure of the whole electrical circuit beneath us, the underworld talked about in mythologies, hell, hollow earth. 
the choke ring, Sheol, Hades, Abaddon, the water tables below the land and oceans. There are dozens of names and theories, and again, what may be underneath that, Rahab, Leviathan, Tehom, Rabbah, Apsu, Tiamat, the shit you just flushed down the toilet is not in the scope of this film. The last and most important thing, if the U.S. Army and NASA are correct and the Earth is flat and not rotating, then the only way the sun could rise in the east and set in the west every 24 hours is if it is circling the Earth and much closer than 93 million miles away. In almost all of these models, the sun and the moon are inside of this dome or enclosure, and the cymatic stars and wandering stars we call planets are attached or connected to it. The bottom line seems to be that instead of thinking of clouds as something being um, a result of the climate, it actually sort of upside down. It is that the climate is a result of changes in the clouds. What we could see was that when the magnetic activity of the sun was larger, then the temperature on the Earth was higher. Nobody had an answer to what kind of mechanism could be the cause of that. We knew that somehow the magnetic activity on the sun had to have an influence on the Earth's climate, direct or indirect. But one day, someone stepped into my office and mentioned cosmic rays. When I heard this word cosmic rays, it made me immediately think of an experiment I did in high school where we had what is called a cloud chamber. Inside the cloud chamber, you have supersaturated air. And when a particle, for instance, a cosmic rays go through, it makes a string of small droplets like a small cloud. With this image in my head, I thought, what if cosmic rays are responsible for forming clouds? And what if the sun with its magnetic field is capable of changing the clouds on Earth? Then we would have a perfect explanation on how the sun would be responsible for climate through our everyday clouds that we see on the sky. Whereas most people would think that since there's water in the atmosphere that naturally there'll be clouds, but that isn't true. The only way that clouds can form in the atmosphere, in our atmosphere, under normal conditions, is to condense onto an aerosol or existing particle in the air. Every cloud droplet that's formed is formed on a particle initially in the air. All clouds are formed upon these aerosols. And so it's absolutely crucial to understand how these particles come about and what their properties are. Otherwise, we can't ever hope to understand clouds and, and their behavior. And that's where cosmic rays actually might come in. Because what do cosmic rays do when they enter the Earth's atmosphere? They produce small ions. It is the belief that these small charges help forming these small specks or aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. If you decrease the amount of low clouds, it will be more heating down the ground. And in particular now, that this new work that they show that there's only the low clouds that changes, there's still a mechanism to explain this that's missing. So there's a fairly large fraction of low clouds. A large part are responsible for a large part of the cooling uh, caused by these clouds. The reason low clouds are so important is that they actually reflect a lot of the sunlight back into space. I mean, we know them from when we travel in airplanes. These are these monotonic scenes that we see over the oceans. And they are wide because they are reflecting uh, the sunlight back into space. And you can imagine if you change the amount of low clouds, you change the amount of energy that the surface gets. That means that low clouds have a strong cooling effect on the Earth's climate. So if we have more low clouds, climate will become colder. And if we have fewer cosmic rays, we have fewer low clouds, and the Earth becomes warmer. 
So the idea is that cosmic rays from exploding stars trillions of miles away bombard the Earth, ionize into aerosol particulates, and cause the lower layer of clouds in our atmosphere, which blocks out the sunlight, causes cooler temperatures, more moisture, and if enough particulates are in the air from volcanic eruptions or any change in the atmospheric composition due to these cosmic ray aerosols, we obviously get more rain, snow, flooding, etc. However, the magnetic solar winds during solar maximum periods, where the sun's magnetic field is stronger, push these cosmic rays away from the Earth, so we get fewer low cloud formations and warmer climate. Even though the Earth's own alleged local magnetic field somehow fails to do the exact same thing. Put in perspective, Imagine a man in India lighting a bonfire and a woman in Alaska's toe getting hot from it. But hang on, what are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are charged particles created outside the solar system. Why do we call them rays then? The reason is that the detection of cosmic rays started even before we could envision what they really are. <laughs> You can't make this shit up. Well, obviously you can, but it gets better. They were initially thought to be some sort of electromagnetic radiation, made up of photons, or as gamma rays are. With the first measurements made in 1912 by Victor Hess, the Nazi Thule Society Nobel Prize winner, with a balloon, we learned that a radiation of a very great penetrating power enters our atmosphere from above, which excluded the sun as its source, obviously. But if NASA, the U.S. Army, and those crazy flat earthers are right, and the sun is local inside our enclosure, and cosmic radiation is just as it was earlier thought, just electromagnetic radiation, from the plasma ether and Earth's local toroidal dynamo field, then this all starts to make a hell of a lot more sense. The higher up we go in an airplane or Mount Everest, the colder it gets. But we're told go way up to the thermosphere, and the solar radiation makes that atmosphere layer 2,000 degrees Celsius, almost double the melting point of steel right where the steel space station and satellites are. Only there's not enough gas molecules to transfer that heat to them, only to the magic infrared thermometer they use to measure the temperature, which can only measure surface temperatures and not internal temperatures, which the thermosphere doesn't have, and which crafts with surfaces in the thermosphere don't get hot enough to measure. But I digress. But if the thermosphere really is that hot because the sun is actually up there with some enclosure trapping the heated air from rising any further, then we have a more local magnetic culprit for affecting etheric plasma in our atmosphere and low cloud formations. During natural grand solar maximum cycles, like we had from 1920 until 2000, when they tried to pin their bullshit man-made global warming carbon tax scam on us, the sun is covered in sunspots when the magnetic field is high. We've now had a few hundred days in a row without any sunspots, and 2019 was only the beginning of the modern Eddy Grand Solar Minimum, set to last until 2090. We've already had worldwide record snowfalls, record rains and flooding, freak floods in Saudi Arabia, massive hailstorms in Guadalajara and Kazakhstan. These just happen in a matter of hours. What's going to happen in the spring when all of this record snow melts and the dams start spilling over and breaking? Even these recent volcanoes this year, Shisheld in Alaska, a VEI-3 eruption raised to Code Red. Sabancaya, New Zealand, a VEI-4. Popocatapetl, Mexico, 
VEI-4, or even Tal Philippines, the VEI-5 that everyone is freaking out about, spewing particulates 9 to 15 kilometers into the atmosphere. These are little piddly drops in the bucket compared to what's coming. It is historical record that major VEI-7 and 8 super eruptions go off during these grand solar minimums, going up to 100 kilometers into the atmosphere, adding ungodly amounts of aerosols and particulates for even more heavy rain cloud seeding, sometimes blocking out the sun for years. Now, I can't speak for Noah, but after a few years of weather like this in your country, I don't think you need the voice of God to tell you you're probably going to need a boat. But rain fell on Oahu, Hawaii for 247 days and nights from 1993 to 1994. 200 days more than Noah's or the many indigenous stories, and the world didn't flood then. There is a huge volume difference between dense monsoon rains and normal seasonal rain, but there is another component that we are missing. We still need to account for the sinking of massive land masses such as Friesland, Palau, and California, as we discussed in this film, as well as the desolation of mountain ranges and the freak electrical phenomenon we described earlier as Lichtenberg patterns and the Son of Man. As it turns out, these events are interrelated with each other and have everything to do with the ether, the composition of atmospheric gases and pressure, compression and decompression cycles, plasma, dielectricity, magnetism, and even the appearance of so-called comets and meteorites. On a side note, our own personal useless opinion after researching this film is that there is no worldwide catastrophe in one day that floods and burns the entire earth. There are billions of thriving species today and ancient ruins that shouldn't be there. Food doesn't grow above the tree lines and these survivors had to eat something when they found dry shores. There are too many illogical problems with that scenario to cover in this short film, though we will discuss the mechanics of a few theories out there that contradict our own opinion. But depending on your experiential worldview at the time, there most definitely were and will be countries and places on this planet that have end-of-the-world events for those unfortunate enough to be living in those areas when these events happen. When we talk about the sun connected to the earth, and I showed you those images of all the interconnected magnetic field lines, etc. I'm just going to make it real super simple and say positive charge and negative charge, like your battery, plus minus. Now over the last 400 years, the earth and the sun have had a chance to equalize their electrical inflows to each other, magnetically, electrically. Well, the sun is quickly stepping down. If it's going to step down in its state and we're still highly charged, where's that electrical field going to go to? It needs to discharge somehow. It's called the global electric circuit. And this is what governments are piggybacking on right here. They know the atmosphere is going to become highly charged on a natural cycle. So what they're going to try to do is ride in on you know, geoengineering and the delivery of a beaming electricity from space. 25 years ago was undoable. Not because of the tech, because of the atmosphere not being highly enough charged to deliver that. Now, bringing back to the effects that we should see, and again, we should be seeing things if it's truly in play. So here we go. Things that were considered incredibly rare, like never ever seen so much that when you would see it or capture it on a film once, it would make front page news because it was that rare. Here we got a, a blue auroral jets, common now. This is an electrical... Uh, discharge up into one of the magnetic field lines coming down from the sun. So our electrical field is actually trying to charge back up and connect to the sun. 
Does this look like it's trying to connect to a sun 93 million miles away? Then why does it stop so quickly? Red sprites, once unheard of, even things of myth and legend. And here we are, now they're common. Almost every electrical storm across the planet is showing these red sprites now. And then we have these, where does lightning usually discharge to? Yeah, it goes from the ground down. Well, now we're getting upward lightning coming off the earth. Well, this is again, it's an equalizing charge. That overcharge is trying to jump out and do something. Does your light socket try to power a building in India? No, it's a closed circuit. It's trying to reconnect with the field lines. So we're starting to see this thing, and I, I highly encourage you to look this up. It's called a global electric circuit, and it explains how the ionosphere is being highly charged on a natural cycle. So we get incredible weather storms and so many electrical effects of, of things that are driven by the motion of this electromagnetism. On Earth, hurricanes and typhoons are called cyclones and occur over the oceans. The cyclonic storm develops an eye in the center of rotation where high altitude dry air is drawn down the center. The thing to know is that the eye of a cyclone is a downdraft wind. Over land we see a different effect. Supercell thunderstorms develop a rotating mesocyclone that rises in a tower that spreads to an anvil cloud. The thing to know is that the center of a thunderstorm is an updraft wind. If you look at these different storms from above, the cyclone blows at the ground and the thunderstorm sucks at the ground. The pattern of wind in each type of storm is due to capacitance in the electrical circuitry of the earth. The electric winds of a thunderstorm can be likened to a rope. Generally the rope winds up the towering mesocyclone to a cap, the anvil cloud, and unwinds from there to non-rotating channels of rain flanked by downdraft winds. It is a stack of dielectric layers through which a current flows. Condensing and then freezing moisture in the updraft sheds ionized matter into cold plasma currents that produce rain, lightning, and tornadoes. A massive cold plasma halo in the sky acts like a live electrode hanging over the ground. The updraft current is from ions swept from ground level. It loops through a negative plasma low in the cloud where condensation occurs and continues to a positive plasma in the anvil where ice forms. At each level, the recombined matter, the rain and ice, are shed and returned to ground. Flanking downdraft winds are excess currents of unipolar wind that complete the storm's looping circuit to ground. As negative charge builds in the bottom wet layers of cloud, it strengthens the local electric field and draws winds to it. Above, in the icy layers at high altitude, a positive layer of charge accumulates to balance the charge below and it spreads out in a huge disk. Likewise, on the ground below the cloud, Positive charge accumulates to balance the cloud charge and feed the central updraft. Lightning arcs contribute to balancing the charged layers, dissipating charge at points of highest potential. But the buildup of charge density around the core of the storm also means there is a secondary vector in the electric field running horizontally through the cloud layers. As ionic matter is drawn to the storm by updraft and concentrated, it depletes charge from the far field region of atmospheric layers, creating local electric fields which draw current horizontally transverse to the electric field at the core of the storm. Consensus science has attributed the electrical charge buildup in thunderstorms to static charge from colliding rain and ice. One flaw in this idea is, there's nothing static anywhere at any time in any place in a thunderstorm. Everything moves, and that means charge too. 
and that means one undeniable thing, electric current. In a hurricane, the airflow is very different from a thunderstorm. Consider the wind flow again as a piece of rope. The rope enters hole down the central vortex and unwinds into several threads of vertical up and down drafts flowing radially away from the storm's eye and rotating currents. It's almost the inverse of a thunderstorm. The cyclone's rotating updraft bands are made of thunderstorms, which electrically suggests the entire cyclone is a next level fractal expression of the thunderstorm in which the independent loops of thunderstorms maintain their form but have organized together creating loops within loops, vortices within vortices, fractal repetition of form. And finally, the discharge modes in a thunderstorm are typically vertical winds, lightning, and tornadoes, whereas in hurricanes you get strong rotating winds, cyclones that produce very little lightning, and comparatively weak tornadoes. One reason a cyclone is different from a mesocyclone is that cyclones form over water. The electrode spot on a featureless homogeneous surface of ocean diffuses charge broadly and evenly. On land, there are mountains, mineral, and water deposits that focus the electric field and provide greater conductivity, increasing charge density at elevations. But a cyclone is not the most powerful level of fractal progression for storms on Earth. The next fractal level of plasma form is when a cyclone and a mesocyclone organize. This creates the most destructive storms of all, at least that we see today. In our historic period, we don't see storms that exceed the level of the so-called perfect storm. When mesocyclone and cyclone come together, they produce a current loop. In our present climate on Earth, the perfect storm is as bad as it gets, but we are only seeing an echo of the drama of primordial storms. Even though we see lightning and devastating 300 mile per hour winds, violent enough to destroy our matchstick homes, it does not scour us with supersonic winds hot plasma tornadoes, and electric arcs that shape mountain ranges. But it did at some point long ago. Or maybe not so long ago? To me, this sounds exactly like the biblical descriptions of the return of the Son of Man in Aquarius, and those described by Chan Thomas in his book, The Adam and Eve Story. Updraft winds of mesocyclones and downdraft eyes of cyclones became supersonic jet streams. An energized geomagnetic field amplified the magnetic flux in coronal loops, generating co-rotating storms that sucked and blew at the land, leaving vast craters and domes. The ring currents multiplied too, generating smaller harmonic repetitions more intense fractal repetitions that produce hot, probably glowing plasma tornadoes and incredibly huge arcs, large enough to boil a mountain from the earth. How will it be this end of which I once heard you speak, Brother Eni? It will be as twere a mighty rending in the sky, <laughs> and the mountain shall sink and the valley shall rise. And will there be a mighty wind? Certainly there will be a mighty wind, if the word of God is anything to go by. Will it wind be so mighty as to lay low the mountains of the earth? Five, four, three, two, one. Now is the end. It was GMT, wasn't it? <laughs> Never mind, lads. Same time tomorrow. As fractal evolution progresses with the application of a larger electric field, thunderstorm cells multiply and their downdrafts grow to cyclones until multi-vortex systems, 
spin within multivortex systems, which are within multivortex systems. We rarely think of vertical winds unless we are right under them, and then it's considered an unusual and an often catastrophic event. Downbursts, tornadoes, and related vertical effects, lightning and storm surge, are the most destructive elements of storms. Vertical winds impact smaller regions but are far more violent than horizontal winds. In primordial storms, Vertical winds literally blow towards the land and sucked at it like a vacuum hose. We can see this in the geology. If you strip away the hydrodynamics of a dense atmosphere, fully ionize the environment to see the raw electric currents in a hot plasma, it's like seeing an x-ray view of a storm. Capacitors are used in electronics and power supply systems to control current flow. They are composed of two conductive plates facing each other with a gap between. The gap is filled with a dielectric material that resists current flow. And in its intended operation, current does not pass through the dielectric. Current results from charge buildup and discharge from the plates on either side of the gap. But what we are interested in for this discussion is how a capacitor fails. Capacitor fails when current actually flows through the dielectric. It's termed dielectric breakdown and occurs when the voltage applied to the capacitor exceeds its capacity to store charge on the plates. The dielectric fails to resist the electric field across it and it sparks. That is what we see when lightning strikes. The dielectric breakdown of the layer of air between a cloud and ground. An ionized channel develops in the dielectric and the built-up charge on the plate suddenly dumps through the channel. We see the discharge as almost instantaneous, but in reality there is a period prior when the dielectric absorbs charge and builds the ionized channel. In storms on Earth, the same looping current flows are in the form of weak plasma winds because the atmosphere is only partially ionized. Cold plasma is mixed with neutral species, so thermoelectric and hydrodynamic effects come into play, raising the complexity, but the underlying electric circuit remains the same. But what if our atmosphere was much more charged not so long ago? People in the 1700s were wearing lightning hats and lightning umbrellas with grounding chains to dissipate a lightning strike and they were taking portable lightning rods, which you can still buy on eBay today, to picnics in their parks. Obviously, you don't go out to the park in a thunderstorm, so why were they afraid of lightning on a sunny picnic day? Is it plausible that the Earth's atmospheric charge is a closed circuit which gets built up over 400 years of relatively peaceful electric field stability but has to discharge and equalize during these grand solar minimums when its equilibrium becomes unbalanced due to the sun's electromagnetic decay and that the atmospheric destructive storms and the Earth's corresponding volcano and quake activity are simply the natural effects of exactly this cause? The problem is, the oceans of the world are littered with ancient underwater ruins, always within 200 feet of water. So did these places sink or did sea levels rise? And could constant storms really cause a 200-foot ocean level rise? The genius occultist, astrologer, and biochemist, Dr. Inez Perry, said of the age of Aquarius, In its readjustment, some parts of the globe will go down, while at the same time islands will appear, new continents will rise, land will be purified, restored, and refreshed and there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. This will be literally and physiologically true. 
She also stated that it is quite possible that it will eventually be discovered that maps of the Earth, as presented on globes, are not based on facts. Thirty-second degree Freemasons are finally given a copy of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, in which the secret of their logo is finally revealed to the Master Mason. The square is a right angle formed by two right lines. It is adapted only to a plane surface and belongs only to geometry, earth measurement, that trigonometry which deals only with planes and with the earth which the ancients supposed to be a plane. The compass describes circles and deals with spherical trigonometry, the science of the spheres and heavens. The former, therefore, is an emblem of what concerns the earth and the body. The latter of what concerns the heavens and the soul. Yet the compass is also used in plain trigonometry as in erecting perpendiculars. If you ever wondered why NASA and the military are littered with high-ranking Freemason shitheads, now you know. But the island of Seltholm lies between Copenhagen, Denmark and Malmo, Sweden. It has an average height of 3 feet above sea level with a highest point of only 16 feet. Humans have lived in small numbers on Seltholm since the Middle Ages and probably before. The existence of the island is first attested in 1230 AD when King Valdemar II of Denmark is recorded as having given salt home to Bishop Niels Steesen of the Sea of Roskilde for quarrying limestone. Yet somehow it's still there today, three feet above sea level, while Friesland, Palau and Old California are now completely underwater, despite being on maps from before the 1650 Maunder Grand Solar Minimum Earth Changes. So either these other islands sunk underwater, or somehow it is possible for sea level to rise hundreds of feet in some places, while not rising at all in other places nearby. Otherwise, Salt Home would be no more. In fact, Denmark itself is a very flat, low to sea level country, and still looks the same today as it did on maps from the 1500s and mid 1600s. So why isn't Denmark underwater as well? The theories of plate tectonics moving, rising, and sinking in certain places but not others could very well explain this phenomenon, though allegedly they are moving all of the time, and there has been no satisfactory scientific explanation as to why all of these earthquake and larger volcanoes go so hyperactive during grand solar minimums. There is also the idea that we live in an enclosed, gas-pressurized system that goes through cycles of compression and decompression, which could push down in certain areas during a pressure adjustment event or let loose and allow other areas to rise again. But other than the bulging of continents in the center, we have personally seen no map evidence of new continents rising, only the disappearance of land masses. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means it's out of the scope of our own personal research. It is possible that massive underwater volcanic activity could create new land masses as well. We'll have to leave that to the volcanists, geologists, and your own imagination. Speaking of disappearing land masses, we do have to address the elephant in the room. On maps predating the 1600s by the world's best cartographers like Mercator, they insisted there were four continents surrounding a giant magnetic mountain called Meru, and that this land is what old books and legends called Hyperborea. It sits exactly where we are told the frozen North Pole sits today. 
A curious thing happens when you visit there on Google Earth. A strange white and black line appears right where Mount Meru should be. Not only that, but you can see blatant sunken continents underneath the water. You have to wonder, what is that that they're hiding? Then you have the 1582 Monte Planisphere map, showing a huge ring of continents completely mapped out with detailed rivers, lakes, towns, creatures, kingdoms, etc., surrounding the Earth as we know it today, drawn completely accurate itself. This map is 10 feet by 10 feet and would have taken him years to draw in full detail. Those outer continents alone would have taken a year to draw. What, he just made it all up? In fact, his map shows the Panama Canal was already there in 1582, even though we allegedly built it in 1902. Or did we just dig it back out? Monte's outer continent ring sits right where the Flat Earth researchers claim there is a wall of ice or liquefied air surrounding us. As with Mercator, he too had a detailed map of the four continents of Hyperborea in the North Pole. So what happened in the 1600s? I know, you want to hear about gigantic space asteroids smashing into the Earth and destroying the dinosaurs and all life on it. We've already discussed the idea that comets being space snowballs is a fabrication and really a local electromagnetic atmospheric phenomenon as orbiting space balls don't turn and change direction and there are hundreds of written historical accounts of comets doing exactly that throughout the ages, sometimes even changing opposite directions back and forth every few nights, most especially in the Book of Miracles. So what about meteorites? Could they also be the same? What about the meteor pieces we find all over the Earth? It is theorized by Russian researchers that meteors are not stones that melt down and burn due to friction and heat from atmospheric resistance upon entry. Meteors appear in the upper atmosphere, usually 90 to 150 kilometers up, as a circular shaped light dragging a thin luminous trail. During the fall, the headlight increasingly amplifies and then expands into a bright flash, followed by what appears like a breaking up into smaller parts that immediately disappear without touching the ground at around 40 to 60 kilometers up. They postulate that the light is not from the fire of burning stone, but rather electricity in the form of electrical discharge. The electric field is permanently present in the higher layers of atmosphere, where air and atmospheric gases act as an electric field conductor. During discharge, electrons and ions get pulsed, accelerated, collided, and multiplied by the electric field, which spreads through the entire path like lightning in the lower atmosphere, until the glowing energy ball turns into a glittering electric flash like the head of a sparkler, and due to particle collision into electrons and ions, 
the temperature increases due to higher energy ionization and that manifests as a strong flash of light like a lightning strike or ball lightning. The meteors finally fizzle out at the lower, denser layers of the atmosphere due to reduced conductivity there, possibly due to the dielectric constant of nitrogen, which makes up 78% of the atmosphere. Nitrogen can normally prevent or rapidly quench electric discharges. The number of positive ions in the upper atmosphere decline as we get lower in the upper atmospheric layer toward the lower atmosphere. Also, with increased pressure in the lower layers of the atmosphere, electrical conductivity is normally reduced. Just like so-called cosmic rays, positive ions lose their energy in collision with electrons, atoms, and particulate molecules, and after a short excited state, return to a lower stable energy state. Another observation is that we always see them coming down or across on diagonal angles, appearing suddenly and silently, and sometimes a ripping thunder sound can be heard behind. If we were living on this, we should observe them as coming up, down, and all around, but they never do. The highest terminal velocity speed freefall set by a human was 167 meters per second. Yet these space rocks, with no propulsion system and no aerodynamic design, are clocked at 10 to 40 kilometers per second, and from appearance to final discharge is usually 2 to 20 seconds. The American Meteor Society can tell you exactly what days and times the annual meteor showers will come and where in the sky to find them, which suggests a normal cyclical electrical phenomenon, not random space rocks, or you would see them in different times and places if we were doing this. You've been in a thunderstorm, Various temperatures, pressure, and atmospheric composition manifest various electrical discharges. Meteors shimmer different colors near the active electric field. Orange, yellow, greenish white, blue, green, silver, purple, just like the noble gases in the upper atmosphere. Why would falling rocks explode in a glittery flash, and why don't we see fiery rocks falling to the ground right after? Heat, fuel, and oxygen are needed for fire. There would be plenty of friction heat and oxygen, but what fuel does a falling rock have? You can heat rocks with another fuel supply, but they don't heat themselves. Most meteors do not leave a lingering tail after fizzle out but it is proposed that when they do, a passage of electrical discharge through the atmospheric gases creates a pillar of highly ionized, energized air, a heated cloud filled with electrically charged ion particles and electrons generated by the movement of electricity through a gaseous substance which forms an unstable chemical state in their composition due to heat effect. As the electric field effect terminates, the ions get rapidly recombined and return to their previous stable and normal chemical state, creating a ripping sound by the sudden spread of gases due to temperature differences inside and outside of the meteor's electric field. But what happens if the electrical charge conditions change in the lower atmosphere and or the nitrogen state changes to lose its dielectric constant. Contrary to popular belief, the air or ether is not oxygen. Only 21% of it is. 78% is nitrogen 
and 0.003% is CO2. So if you think your breath and farts are ruining the planet, you might be a fucking idiot. But back to the 78% nitrogen. Nitrogen loses its dielectric constant and becomes highly conductive and volatile when turned from air to liquid form or near liquid, which simply requires a reduction in temperature, like a grand solar minimum or ice age, and an increase in pressure, like major volcanic particulate eruptions and cloud formations into an enclosed pressure system. It might surprise you that no meteorite has ever been observed to make contact with the ground. The earth is littered with what lamestream science tells us are meteorite impact craters. But as we just saw, all meteorites come down on a diagonal angle and break up into smaller pieces. These craters are all perfectly round with the same depth and wall height. They should be long, dragged out craters with a higher wall at the end if they were giant space rocks crashing in at supersonic speeds from an angle. Some claim they are nuclear blast sites from an ancient nuclear war, as mentioned in the Indian Vedas and Mahabharata, though they look exactly like the sputtering electric discharge domes that Andrew Hall mentioned earlier. Whatever they are, they aren't space rock craters. The dome structure of the plateau and the canyons carved through it is primarily the result of natural sputtering discharge process created during an intense electrical storm when Earth's electric field was amplified to the point the entire atmosphere was ionized. Imagine the atmosphere stirred into a maelstrom lit with streamers of glowing plasma where lightning crackled not only in the sky but across the land and mountaintops glowed with coronal fire under swirling clouds of dusky plasma. It would have been surreal, a place where streams of wind became electric currents. But meteorite pieces are found all around the world. They aren't in huge craters, only in what you'd expect if you'd pushed a boulder off of a skyscraper. In the town of Krzevci, northern Croatia, three meteorites with identical chemical and gem composition fell in the exact same place three different times in 2007, 2011, and 2012. It's hard to imagine how this is even remotely possible if we are living on this. However, the plot thickens because during the 2011 event, the Croatian Meteor Network actually filmed the atmospheric meteor phenomenon from several different cameras and an observatory in nearby Slovenia captured the very beginning of the phenomenon. Just as we discussed earlier, the bright light broke up into severe fragmentation at 60 to 31 kilometers up, as always. You could argue that the government planted the meteorites as a conspiratorial cover-up but do these look like government spooks to you? <laughs> Meteorites are made of mostly iron, with additional nickel, silicon, cobalt, geranium, titanium, iridium, copper, zinc, chrome, olivine gems, and some minerals. Some people suspect that this dome or enclosure is not the Van Allen radiation belts or some magnetic flip ring, but that it's an actual physical iron and gem dome and that these meteorites we find are actually pieces falling down from the dome. This would go a long way as to explain how on God's earth we could possibly live in a pressurized atmospheric gas system when NASA tells us that space is a vacuum, which we all know a vacuum needs a physical barrier, which is the reason your vacuum cleaner has a bag, 
Otherwise, space would suck our atmosphere right off our planet. And yet they also claim the universe is an ever-expanding space vacuum. Well, what bag is around space if it's ever-expanding? While paradoxically, a confined vacuum. This idea obviously scares the hell out of people because no longer are you a meaningless accidental speck of Big Bang dust and in infinite space. You have to ponder the dirty G word. No, not that one. This one. And say, well, if everything came from nothing, well then who's this guy? The idea that we live in a computer simulation or are just some science experiment on the desk of some higher being is a very old one. There are fringe researchers and people out there who take the Bible and mythology literally and believe that we do live in exactly something like that. A giant mechanical machine with a physically constructed exterior and even working machine parts underneath us which control the tides, winds, ocean levels, volcanic vents, earth plate pressure tectonics, even the movement of the sun, moon, wandering planets and stars on either a rotating mechanical dome above us and around us or magnetically inside of it. We're already way off the deep end here, so I don't want to dwell on it too much, but there are some curious things worth looking at at this theory. It suggests that the cataclysm resets could be actual highly advanced technological machines that clean out the fish tank, so to speak, and that the stars are the maintenance calendar. The Hebrew Bible uses very mechanical translations to describe the flood events. A floodgate is a gate used to control the flow of a body of water, something that restrains a flood or outpouring, or an adjustable gate or valve used to control the flow of water through a sluice, which is an artificial channel. The springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. And after seven days the flood waters came upon the earth. All the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. Yet he commanded the clouds above, and opened the doors of the heavens. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, thou shalt see it with thine eyes. Dante's Inferno speaks of the nine levels of hell below the earth. In fact, hell and Niflheim are the names of the underworld in Norse mythology. The Egyptians have the same stories of the many levels of the Duat, in ancient Egyptian cosmology, the earth was thought to be flat and oval-shaped and surrounded by oceans. Underneath this earth lay the vast expanse of the underworld, which also had the primordial waters of Nun running through them, which is very similar to the Hebrews Sheol and the Great Deep, and maybe where the Hebrews got that from. The Romans and Greeks had Hades and Tartarus. We think of the underworld as some dimension, who knows where, where dead souls go for judgment or retribution. But the very word itself literally means the place under our world, what some people might call hollow earth, or the legendary Agartha, the land of the advanced races. But race implies actual physical beings, not spirits. 
We have myths of master crafting dwarves working in the forges deep below our mountains, and even the Hopi stories of surviving a cataclysm by hiding under the earth with the ant people. A large portion of UFO sightings claim these crafts come in and out of mountainsides or volcanoes and even come flying out of the oceans and crashing back in, defying all known laws of physics. The Celtic lores of fairies abducting women and children and taking them down to their underground fairy dens is remarkably similar to the so-called modern alien abduction phenomenon. The two most common threads among the stories of people claiming to be abductees is that there is some kind of breeding or genetic purpose to these abductions and that they are either shown telepathically or are conveyed the feeling that this is because they are part of some kind of future after an apocalyptic event and their genetics or hybrid offspring will be part of the new future. Very similar, in fact, to the Hopi story of the ant people choosing to save them to carry on after just such a cataclysm. Then there are the bizarre stories and conspiracy claims that governments are secretly working with the Greys in the deep underground military bases, breeding programs, technology trading, the list goes on and on. Phil Schneider even claimed we've accidentally dug into gray lairs while drilling these bases and had military skirmishes with them. Of course, the whole phenomenon could be a mixture of orchestrated rabbit hole diversions and the attention-seeking fantasies of the lunatic fringe. But is it just possible that fairies and greys are real, are not extraterrestrial, but terra-terrestrial, and are the workers who run the machines down in the underworld. Maybe UFOs are just their maintenance shuttles, and maybe they are in fact tasked with exactly what the Hopis and abductees claim, some kind of genetic update or program to get a certain amount of people ready to live in some kind of drastically different future reality. The stereotypical description of these creatures, their hive-minded behavior, and advanced technology certainly suits a subterranean worker drone. If you spend time on Google Earth, you'll notice the oceans of the world are riddled with perfect unnatural geometric grids and what look like long tunnels, pipes, or roads, very much like you'd expect to see in a machine. Even this one leading from the sunken island of Friesland to this strange area. What are those? You may want to revisit parts 3 through 5 of this film after this final section, which is Brian Austin Lambert's theory of the EMPCO, Electromagnetic Plasma Changeover Event, which coincides with a lot of the occult Masonic subliminal references throughout this film. We'll put a link to his 3 hour film and try like Jesus to sum up the nuts and bolts in the next 10 minutes. It is the marriage of the flat earth and electric universe theory with a twist literally. Like NASA and Inez Perry, Brian maintains that we live on a flat, non-rotating Earth. In his model, the dome is made of ice from an electromagnetic current, which separates the biblical waters above it from the waters down here, and the ice ring around the edge, as the waters are frozen at the points closest to the electromagnetic energy dome, just as Inez Perry postulated, since energy never fails to take a circular course. However, the sun is not moving. Only the angular light refraction from its true moving plasma source makes it appear that way. Let's explain. 
Here again, we have a chicken or the egg conundrum where neither can exist without each other as both define each other's existence. Some call this phenomenon God. Alfin proposed the galaxy is plasma that carries the electric currents which create a large-scale magnetic field in which charged particles move in spiral orbits within it. Lambert claims that plasma is really the first state of matter and that electromagnetic energy converts to plasma through a magnetic bowl structure. How can electromagnetic energy create plasma when plasma creates the magnetic field which converts energy to plasma via a magnetic bowl structure created by plasma electricity? Somebody is full of bowl shit. But this magnetic bowl confines and condenses the energy into matter by temperature, hot to cold, which comes from... Confused? You won't be after this episode of... So... Brian maintains that the real power source of our sun is what NASA calls the Red Rectangular Nebula, somewhere in or beyond the biblical waters above, and that ancients used to see it in the sky before the last EMCO event, that we will see it again up there after this coming one, and that it is the true source of the Masonic symbol of the pyramid and all-seeing eye, as well as the three Abrahamic religions. Six connected pyramids make the cube of Islam and Judaism. Unfold the cube and you get the cross of Christianity. He maintains that this red pyramid structure is an electromagnetic formation which causes plasma to be formed, which revolves around the pyramid, becomes illuminated and condenses, and then flows through the electromagnetic field structure towards us in a spiral vortex shape, wider at the nebula and narrower at our dome, drawn magnetically to our electromagnetic field and ice dome. He suggests our electromagnetic dome repulses the plasma spiral's heat away so the dome doesn't melt, but the clear distilled ice allows the light from the inner energized plasma coil to enter and refract through the dome to a convergence point between the dome and the earth in the sky, like a magnifying glass or a convergent photonic laser, which is where the real heat is and then that hot concentrated light point diverges back out and down on us, unlike the Death Star laser. Plasma is a fluid and Birkeland currents flow in the shape of a spiral from the right-hand rule of electricity. If a current is flowing from our ground to the sky, the electric field rotates counterclockwise or west to east. But since this alleged current is flowing from the red rectangle nebula toward us, then it would be spinning clockwise or east to west. Just as the sun does. His theory is that since these plasma currents not only spiral, but expand, contract, and pulse in intensity, that this current spirals around the dome once every 24 hours and that the angular refracted optics make the light focal point in our sky go around in a circle. A disco ball has one non-moving source light, but the ball moves. And so if you were to follow any one of the reflected light focal points on the wall, you would notice it moves along the wall even though the source light doesn't move. In his model, the disco ball or ice dome is not moving, but the spiraling circle plasma current light source is instead moving around the ball. But instead of reflecting onto an outer surface like a wall, it's refracting to a focal point in the sky that we just perceive as a sun circling over our head from our vantage point below.
So nighttime is just the absence of the sun refraction focal point since the light emitting part of the plasma spiral is on the other side of the dome. But then, what's all this and what's moving it? His model is based on the Hebrew model in Old Testament, which states, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. So the firmament is not the dome. The firmament is what we call the sky or atmosphere. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So by his model, the sun, moon, and stars must all have an external plasma filament light source refracting in through the dome and waters above. Unfortunately, it would take six hours and 50 video editing hours to sit here explaining David LaPointe's primer fields and Brian's entire model, zeta pinches, plasma confinement systems, Vajras, Lorentz force, electromagnetics, magnetic field compression, magnetohydrodynamics, and on and on the list goes. You'll need to watch both of their series to fully understand his model, and I'll be the first to say I have some serious problems with it, but find it quite curious for the most part. I will show a short clip of David LaPointe's primer field plasma experiments and then try to sum up what Brian claims is going to happen and when. If you're interested, you can research further into both topics yourself. In the primer fields part one, the plasma formations were often shown starting out with long arcs that gradually transitioned into a stable formation. This startup transition was due to a change in the vacuum level alone. Once the vacuum level is stabilized at the correct level for the plasma formation desired, the light emitted by the glowing plasma can be turned off and on instantly. So the electricity is not responsible for the fields that form the plasma formations. The electrical polarity determines how the plasma conforms to the fields, but the fields are not at all formed by the electricity. A reversal of the electrical current that causes the plasma to glow will cause an entirely different pattern to be revealed in the vacuum chamber. But this is due to a simple polarization change in the plasma which reveals a different aspect of the same field structure. The electrical polarity is not causing the fields to change, it is just changing how the plasma responds to the fields. Here we see the instantaneous effects of this electrical polarity reversal as the DC electrical supply is switched between polarity states just as you would flip a light switch on and off. Brian maintains that just as a figure skater spins tighter and faster as they pull their arms in, the plasma spiral in our circuit is doing the same from the final surge of electricity before the change of direction and current, or electric polarity reversal. The days will get shorter and the sun will disappear when the plasma event causes the directional flow of electrical current to change directions. During the changeover, the light we call the sun gets replaced by the plasma and then the new world order begins. The blue sky will be replaced by the red sky or red dawn. And there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, literally. We all know the story of Jesus dying on the cross and being resurrected after three days and its pagan origin of the sun standing still and not traveling any further south or lower in the ecliptic for three days on the December 21st solstice until it rises again and heads back north and higher in the sky on the 24th. 
He maintains that when the sun continues to travel south on the 21st instead of stopping, that will be the time of the EMCO event. December 25th through January 31st, the seven days of creation in Genesis. And that our Christmas trees and New Year's Eve fireworks are really there to remind us of what was and is coming again in our skies and to celebrate another year of escaping it. But hey, at least we don't have biblical locust plagues upon us yet, right? Oh. For the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, stop that. This film is depressing enough. One will be taken, the other will be... Knock it off. We're done. It will be as in the days of Noah. Oh, for fuck's sake. And the days shall be shortened. 